What do you need to compete with the fiercest predators on Earth? To tame fire. To make tools. To survive cataclysmic natural disasters. And ultimately turn yourself from being an ape-like creature into a human being. All we're doing is uncovering the secrets of the dead. We're looking back millions of years. This is the story of our battle to survive. Our species nearly went extinct. The struggle that eventually propelled one animal to rise above all other creatures on Earth. This is our story. The story of what makes us human. Naked science has come to South Africa on a hunt to discover what makes us human. Here, we hope to find the secrets of our past, how we developed language and intelligence, what it was that turned us from simple beasts into human beings. Heading up the inquiry is Dr. Lee Berger, a scientific detective who spends his life sniffing out fossils of human-like creatures. It's looking for our ancestors. It's not just the ancestor of an animal out there. It's telling us about where we come from, what we are, what makes us tick as humans, what makes us maybe the most unique animal on the planet. Berger is on the way to Gladysvale Caves, west of Johannesburg. It's a African phenomenon. The fossils are going to be in Africa. That's where our whole story took place. Every single critical event in human evolution comes from this continent. From fossils found in caves in this area, paleoanthropologists like Berger have unraveled the details of our past. Here we have, over the past three million years, probably the best record. Everything from the origin of our big brains to the origin of fire to the early tools, right down through the evolution of modern humans. This is one of those extraordinary situations in the fossil record that you can only see here in southern Africa. Quite literally, tens of thousands of bones packed together over millennium into one small area. Among the hundreds of creatures found buried in caves like this, are the fossils of three early members of our family tree. One of them is our direct ancestor, early Homo sapiens. He walked the plains of Africa nearly 200,000 years ago. Yet he isn't the first creature to show human traits. Archaeological sites in Africa hold the remains of two other species that both had human characteristics. These three very different creatures have one thing in common. They all share at least one sign of being human. But this is no historical romance. It's a bloody and violent tale. Because only one of these creatures is our ancestor. Only one will survive to become modern humans. So let's meet our unusual suspects. First up is Australopithecus afarensis. It's a big name for a small guy with a little brain. And yet he managed an astonishing achievement. Nearly four million years ago, he stood up and walked on two legs. That, say some, is enough to make you human. But how does he compare to our next candidate, Homo erectus? He appeared about 1.8 million years ago. His brain is still only two-thirds the size of ours. But his gift to humanity is tool-making and the ability to control fire. So does he exhibit essential human traits? Finally, our third species is early Homo sapiens. They lived just 200,000 years ago. They look like us, have a brain the size of our own, but are still a long way from behaving like us. Upright strides, brain size, behavior. What factor is it that makes us humans human? And why did only one of these three species ultimately evolve to become us? 
Our investigation begins with the old mall, Afarensis. What is it that makes her different from the other apes that roamed Africa four million years ago? To answer that question, we have to go back to the 1970s. For decades, fossil detectives have searched obsessively for the smoking gun of human evolution. An ape-like fossil that will reveal when humans evolved away from apes. What they think they need to find is the fossil of an ape with a big brain. Ethiopia, 1974. Scientists unearth an intriguing fossil. They study the rocks where it's found and figure out it's about 3.2 million years old. When they reconstruct the skull, they find its brain is little bigger than a chimpanzee's. But when they examine the pelvis, they're stunned because it's incredibly similar to ours. This pelvis means the creature must have walked on two legs just like us. It's a revelation. A few apes and other mammals will pull themselves up onto two legs, but only for short periods of time. Only humans can truly walk this way, what scientists call bipedalism. Bipedalism is the first trait we look for for defining something in our family tree. The scientists of the 70s give their new species the scientific name Australopithecus afarensis, but they nickname it Lucy after the Beatles song, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. The afarensis has many ape-like qualities. Due to her small brain, she survives on instinct rather than intellect. But her bipedalism frees up her hands, allowing her to hold things and, most importantly, scavenge for better food. This remarkable fossil proves the afarensis was walking upright just like human beings today. But how vital is this amid the catalog of qualities that make us human? If we came face to face with Afarensis today, would we consider her human? Or even a distant ancestor? Only bringing Afarensis to life would answer that question. To do that, we traveled to the world of feature film makeup artistry. In England, Nick Williams creates prosthetics for the film industry. Peter Elliott studies and acts out primate behavior for movies such as Gorillas in the Mist. Somehow, from this fossil skeleton, Williams and Elliott have to capture what Afarensis might have looked like. To help them, they've called in Professor Leslie Aiello, one of the world's leading experts on ancient anatomy. The evidence we have comes in small bits and pieces. Yeah. We've got a 40% complete skeleton there. And what's missing on one side is present on the other side, so you can mirror image it. And it uh, allows us to understand the proportions of the whole body. Afarensis was smaller than a modern human. And this gives Williams and Elliot their first problem. The head was much smaller than ours, with a brain a third the size, about the same as a chimpanzee's. I mean, if I'd have the top of my head cut off, it'd be a lot easier, wouldn't it? I mean, look, the eye sockets are almost at the top of the head. One bone shows a protruding jaw, another challenge for the team. Because this has helped us for just, you know, bringing it forward, actually having that slope down. Yeah, what, bringing the whole sort of Thing proboscis out, area forward. Which sort of helps not and it gives you that back. line. Yeah, yeah, no, that's true. Do you think you'll be able to actually see when we open the mouth? Because its teeth will sit out here, won't they? Well, I was thinking sort of not so far, like literally on the edge of yours. Right, so it's right. Sort of quite close. Right here. From anatomical diagrams, Williams constructs an afarensis muzzle, half human, half ape. Yeah, it feels pretty good, actually. Look at your glasses, so it's no pain, no gain. The completed afarensis jaw transforms Elliot's modern human head. Williams builds in animatronics to control the mouth movements. Right. Then covers the wire and tape skeleton with rubberized flesh. Aiello watches entranced as our distant relative comes to life. It really helps to inform our hypotheses about these early ancestors. If we actually see them with the flesh on, what the face might have looked like, what the movements are based on some of our non-human relatives. But there's something missing. If Peter Elliott is going to portray Afarensis accurately, 
he needs to know exactly how it walked. One clue lies in the pelvis. It's actually the pelvis that allows us to stand upright, support our trunk in an upright posture, and also to move our legs in uh, the way that we move them in bipedal locomotion. But the pelvis alone doesn't tell Peter how to walk the walk. How exactly did an ancient ape man strut his stuff? Scientists think they know the answer, all thanks to an extraordinary series of coincidences. Three and a half million years ago, a group of afarensis live here, on the East African plain of Leitoli. Then, one day, a nearby volcano erupts. It covers the landscape in a layer of fine ash. Shortly afterwards, a shower of rain turns the ash to the consistency of wet cement. Then, two afarensis, probably a male and a female, go for a walk. A journey that will be preserved forever. As they walk in the wet ash, they leave their footprints. There they remain undiscovered until 1976. To find out more about this vital clue, we travel to the University of Southern California. Craig Stanford is an expert in grade 8 behavior and human origins. He appreciates just what a crucial moment the footprints represent. Well, I told you footprints are without question the most important footprints along with Neil Armstrong's on the moon in human history. The footprints help fossil detectives build their profile of the afarensis. Scientists figure they are between three and a half to five feet tall. But that's not all. The Lytoli footprints are ironically perhaps more important than many of the actual fossilized bones that have been found because they tell us about behavior. And one of the hardest things to reconstruct for us is the behavior of ancient extinct creatures, including our ancestors. These footprints tell us these creatures were walking as a group, or at least a pair. They were walking in some direction that day, and most of all, they were walking in this bipedal upright posture that we know was a hallmark of the earliest humans. For Stanford, the heels, arch, and toes of the creature that left the prints three and a half million years ago are remarkably familiar. If you look at this, I mean, my, what I'm always struck by is that it's as if I'm at the beach, and I'm looking at here the footprints made by one of my children, maybe by about a eight or 10 year old child walking across the beach. And it would never occur to you that it was anything other than a human. The imprint and stride length of the Leitoli footprints offer important insights into how the afarensis moved. Most importantly for our team, they offer clues for how Elliot should walk. And, yeah, they, well, and it looked like they were rolling the weight around and pushing off with their big toe like we Yeah, because of course they've got that yeah. bigger, that extended big toe. Yeah, and so it's, uh, you know, it's how much they did it. It always felt right to actually change your weight more from side to side. Knowing that the afarensis still had many ape-like characteristics, the team base eye and skin color on those of an ape. It takes three hours to transform Elliot into a scientifically accurate specimen. Finally, he's ready to meet his public. Coming up on Naked Science, a four million year old ape man runs loose on the city streets. How early human-like creatures made stone tools, and how modern butchers put two million year old knives to the test. You can see there that slices that easy. Naked Science is on a mission to find out what makes us human. We're investigating three ancient species, each one possessing some human characteristics. The oldest of these, Australopithecus afarensis, lived 3.9 million years ago. But to what extent could it be considered human? It could walk on two legs, but is that enough? Moving on two legs is absolutely significant. It seems to be, to excuse the pun, the first step on the human line. 
The one anatomical feature we have that distinguishes the apes from ourselves in these early time periods is this ability to move on two legs. great fun to see somebody trying to recreate an afarensis because the recreation is actually based on the science. About four million years ago, this creature stood upright. With agile hands now freed from walking duties, he was more human-like than any creature that had gone before. But just how human was an afarensis? We want to know if the man and woman in the street would recognize any shadow of themselves in this long extinct creature. When Elliot heads into central London in the guise of an afarensis, he stops the traffic. All heads turn. Pretty soon, everyone's got a camera. But do they want his photo as a memento of a long-lost relative or because they think he's an escapee from the local zoo? Do they think the afarensis is more human or more like an ape? Oh, he's definitely ape-like. It looks more like an ape. I think his body looks like an ape, but his face looks quite human-like. <laughs> it reminds me of Planet of the Apes and King Kong. The fact is, the afarensis brain never evolved to what we would recognize as the human brain of today. His behavior is also distinctly ape-like. I can see a connection to the humans, but it doesn't look like a man. He may not look or behave much like us, but afarensis does have some similarities. His hearing is as good as ours. And his eyesight is more important to him than his sense of smell, just like us. And, of course, he walks on two legs. He was, in important ways, unlike any other creature on Earth. Many scientists agree he was evolving some very human-like traits. But today he's perceived as decidedly ape-like, not human. And why not? He doesn't have our language skills, our ability to make tools, or our creativity. He's furry, hunched, and by human standards, not very bright. So since Afarensis doesn't qualify as human, let's look through the millennia for a biped with a bigger brain, a more human-like physique, and better manners. One proto-human with all those criteria on his resume is Homo erectus. In 1984, a fascinating discovery is made. Archaeologists working in Tanzania, East Africa, uncover a remarkably well-preserved skeleton on the banks of Lake Turkana. At the time, they classify the fossil as Homo erectus. And erectus has one distinctive characteristic. He has a huge skull. The volume of his head cavity is nearly two pints, more than twice that of an afarensis. That's still only around two-thirds the size of an adult human brain. But it's big enough to enable Homo erectus to achieve more than just walking on two legs. It's about a million years since afarensis died out and Homo erectus is leading a very different lifestyle, one that would prove extremely successful. Afarensis walked the Earth for one million years. Homo erectus, however, walked the Earth for almost two million years before he became extinct. That's 17 times longer than we've survived so far. Somewhat amazingly, the fossil finds show that although Homo erectus did not evolve into us, by the time he became extinct, his brain was approaching the size of our own. But just how did Homo erectus 
develop such a big brain? Once again, the fossil detectives hold the clues. Back out in the field, paleoanthropologist Dr. Lee Berger is looking for signs of Homo erectus. This time, he's not seeking fossilized bones, but tiny stone chips that show that Homo erectus has been here. There's no greater moment than when you see a tool for the first time. That's an extraordinary moment in the life science. It makes it all worthwhile. These tools of Homo erectus are the mother of all inventions. Using tools like these, Homo erectus can butcher meat and in doing so, change his diet. The protein this provides is like rocket fuel for the brain. Over time, it powers the brain to evolve and grow. A large brain is one of the characteristics that defines humans, and toolmaking is one of the driving forces of our evolution. A million years before Homo erectus, Afarensis might have picked up a rock to smash things, but there's no way he had the brain power to actually make a tool. Scientists know that Homo erectus has a bigger brain. Can his basic level of intelligence be considered a human characteristic? To find out, we travel to the Stone Age Institute in Indiana. Here, experimental archaeologist Professor Nick Toth believes that the best way to understand Homo erectus's intelligence is by studying his tools. But it's not just the tools that interest Toth, it's how they're made. The more we understand how these tools were made and especially how they were used, I think we get great insights into how our ancestors evolved. To do this, Toth studies how to recreate primitive tools. This way, he can get inside the mind of Homo erectus. First, Toth has to check out that Erectus was using brains, not brawn. His actions are filmed, and the results digitized into a computer. The team analyze his technique frame by frame, so they can study the biomechanics of the tool-making action. From this, the scientists calculate how much strength Toth is using. They can also detect exactly which muscles he employs. The computer-analyzed film reveals that the technique lies in a skilled wrist action, and that would require substantial brain power to initiate, proof that Erectus was using his brain. By making the tools himself, Toth discovers things that the fossil record can't tell us. The number of decisions the Homo Erectus must have made with each strike of the stone, the force of his blows, and the angle of impact. These are just some of the factors that he has to consider. When you're making a sophisticated stone tool, you're making thousands of decisions. And I'm amazed that our ancestors were able to do this. It tells us something about their intelligence and the evolution of intelligence and cognition in the fossil record. Toth now knows that Homo erectus was beginning to solve problems, another feature of the modern human brain. But just how effective is his handiwork? One way of finding out is to compare the tools of Homo erectus to those we use today. To do this, we traveled to Spencer in Indiana to find some real experts. Stephen and Louis Fender are butcher brothers. Their normal tool of choice the very sharpest of metal blades. With their modern blades, the butchers can cut an 800-pound steer into steaks in just 60 minutes. But today they're stepping a million years back in time to check out the stone tools of Homo erectus. So how will they fare?
The brothers have never used stone tools before and quickly conclude that primitive man must have had a better technique than their own. The cutting edge is almost as sharp and effective as that of a modern day metal knife. So if you can see there, that slices that easily. But without handles they're familiar with, the brothers find the tools cumbersome to use. Be careful. You give this to your pet to uh, saber tooth tiger. It takes them four times longer than with their normal steel blades. Okay. It definitely works. But the steer never really had a chance. There we go. Finally. So the verdict? Homo erectus was a pretty good toolmaker. During his time on Earth, Homo erectus' skills pay off. His brain grows by 20% over two million years. But even armed with these tools and a bigger brain, Homo erectus still faces a battle to survive. On the African plains, he lives in daily fear of savage beasts, raging fires. Next, Naked Science returns to Africa to reveal how Homo erectus used his developing intelligence to turn one deadly enemy against another. Naked Science goes to Africa to find out what it is that makes us human. Nearly two million years ago, Homo erectus possesses an essential human trait, a bigger brain than his ancestors, and more brain power. But is that really enough to mark him out as different to the rest of the animal kingdom? Some scientists think it is. The evidence comes from the way our ancestor used his intelligence in a battle to survive. But what if the battle is so uneven that success is all but impossible? What if your opponent has longer teeth, can kill in a single bite, and can outrun you at every turn? This is what Homo erectus faces, the leopard. One man who understands the leopard's deadly power is Brian Jones, who rescues them and rehabilitates them into the wild. To me, leopards, are the most dangerous animals in Africa. He's short-tempered and can fly into you. <coughs> Leopards have always been a threat to humans. You don't want to get on the wrong side of a predator like this, and nor did Homo erectus. It would mean a terrifying grisly death. When leopard hit you, really they mince you up. He scalps you, he puts one paw over, he rips your scalp off, and his back legs grab your stomach and rips you. Unless our early ancestors developed an effective means of protection, they would have been perfect prey for the leopard. In fact, they were. Dr. Francis Thackeray of Pretoria's Transvaal Museum in South Africa has the evidence found in this cave system. They actually have skulls of ape men, and there are in fact two holes in the skull, and the distance between holes matches the distance between the tips of the canines of this leopard. And rather like detectives at the scene of a crime, we could see that this was a specimen killed by a leopard. So this proto-human met a horrific death in the jaws of a leopard. Homo erectus lives in constant fear of such attacks. He can't outrun the beasts or stand any chance in a fight. But he does have one advantage over the leopard, his bigger brain. And with it, he has the opportunity of doing something astonishing. If he can use his brain to control fire, he can use flames to fight back against the fangs. But is there evidence that Homo erectus could in any way control fire? Thackeray believes there is. He has evidence that Erectus was using fire in the cave, probably for warmth and possibly for cooking. Here, burned animal bones have been found from one million years ago, and parts of some of these bones are speckled with white marks, a sure sign that they have been burned at a high temperature. Thackeray believes that these are an indicator of early humanity, and also evidence that Homo erectus is beginning to take control of his environment. 
But to prove this, Thackeray has to rule out the possibility that the bones were subjected to such temperatures in a natural wildfire. Lightning strikes southern Africa. The landscapes set ablaze. Bushfires rage out of control. These fires are incredibly powerful. It would have been the same in the time of Homo erectus. Could the bones found back at the cave have simply been burned by an act of nature rather than by an act of man? To investigate, we enlist the help of Chris Austin of South Africa's Working on Fire program. His job is to control these fast-moving bushfires. Grass fires under certain conditions with very strong winds, you, even in a, in a pickup truck, you wouldn't get away from it. Austin knows the fires are fast enough to trap an animal. But are they hot enough to create white specks on the bones? To find out, Austin plants an antelope carcass in the path of the flames. The next day, he goes back to check the carcass. It's definitely been burned, but how severely? The bones are charred, but look nothing like those found back at the cave. Some of the bones in the cave were burned to such high temperatures that parts of them turned white. Temperatures as high as that can only be achieved by a stationary fire. We can rule out a natural bush fire in the case of many of these burnt bones. Clearly, they were burnt under controlled circumstances within the confines of the cave. Thackeray believes that Erectus didn't have the brain power to start a fire. But he would have been capable of taking a burning twig from a bushfire. And that alone would have transformed his world. By controlling fire, he can cook food, heat cold winter dwellings, and, not least, scare away his enemies. It's probable that no creature on Earth had ever done this before, and its implications would echo down the millennia. It's a remarkable technological development to be able to control the use of fire. Without the controlled use of fire, it would not be possible to have a rocket. Without a rocket, one could never get to the moon, for example. So the controlled use of fire represents that first small technological step that led to the giant leap of lunar exploration. If Homo erectus evolves such human traits, is he really that different to a modern human being? To see how similar they are, Naked Science compares him with modern man. We're setting out to rebuild him based on the evidence of the fossil records. To recreate our Homo erectus, we've called in an actor, Mike Hammond. A strong build, agile, and with an uncanny ability to walk on two legs, he's the ideal candidate. But he needs a bit of Hollywood movie magic to make him look the part. So what clues does our makeup artist have to work with? Measurements of Homo erectus bones found in Africa suggest that an adult could grow to between four and six feet high. It's likely that his demanding environment would have made him flexible and strong. We also know from his tool use that his hands were probably much like ours, with dexterous thumbs. And scientific evidence also shows that he could move efficiently on two legs. Stage one is a prosthetic mask to make Hammond's facial features look more like those of Homo erectus. Even though Erectus's head is bigger than his predecessors, the special effects guys have to make it look no more than two-thirds the size of our own. The thing about Homo erectus is their body proportions are becoming more like ours. You get the feeling that you would be more comfortable with talking to them and being around them. But how comfortable would we feel fraternizing with this creature from our past? 
With the makeover complete, Homo erectus is ready to face his jury. Out on the streets of Los Angeles, will the locals think him ape-like or just another Hollywood hopeful? His face looks like a monkey. The real Homo erectus would have been naked. For the sake of public decency, we made Hammond don a loincloth. Even dressed like this, nobody pays much attention. But then, this is L.A. His meat-enhanced brain could have been capable of basic communication, but not language or speech as we know it. What is, what is it After a while, things start to look a little more positive for our Homo erectus. He looks very human. Yeah, he does. His hair. <laughs> He's hairy! And I think one of my yeah. ex-boyfriends look like this one, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Homo erectus became extinct around 50,000 years ago. As with Afarensis, he did not evolve into us. But his achievements live on. The ability to make tools and control fire are still with us today. But Homo erectus didn't have the essential features that make us truly special. A large brain, creativity, and the ability to solve problems. For that, naked science looks to the wise man of the animal kingdom, the early Homo sapiens. But does even membership in this species guarantee possession of the true characteristics of humankind? Do early Homo sapiens display the qualities that make us uniquely human and that have led to the myriad achievements of modern man? So far in our incredible journey to discover what it is that makes humans human, we've looked at Afarensis, a creature that walked on two legs and Homo erectus, who took advantage of his larger protein-powered brain to make tools and figure out how to control fire. Afarensis and Homo erectus show some obvious human traits with their abilities. Yet still they lack a fundamental characteristic that defines what it means to be a modern human. To appreciate what that is, we turn to our own species. Homo sapiens. The translation from the Latin name must surely give us hope. It means the wise man. One of the key characteristics of our species is a whopping three-pint brain. That's bigger than that of an afarensis and an erectus combined. And it's this relatively huge brain that helps us achieve things no other species can. Through millions of years of walking upright, using hands, and eating meat, the brain of our distant ancestors evolved to become larger and larger. Eventually, our species was born. The first Homo sapiens to roam the planet appear in Africa almost 200,000 years ago. So can they claim to possess the essential traits that make us human? Dr. Lee Berger isn't convinced. Archaic Homo sapiens? That's tricky. You're right there at 200, 250,000 years on the cusp of modernity. But they still aren't quite us yet. For scientists like Berger, just belonging to the Homo sapien species is not enough to qualify as human. So what is the big difference between us and our ancient forefathers? At Washington, D.C.'s National Geographic Society's studios, geneticist Dr. Spencer Wells believes that there is one thing above all else that makes us truly human. The essence of humanity to me is creativity. It is the ability to envision things that aren't there and to make them happen. And that probably, or quite possibly, 
um, involved language. We are our brains. Our brains define us. And in fact, it's, it's the only tool that we really have as a species. It's the thing that makes us adaptable. And we adapt very quickly culturally because we have this amazing brain. But is this amazing creative imagination something we've always had as a species? So far, there's no evidence that early Homo sapiens had any great level of creativity. His tools were still primitive. There's no sign of pottery or cave paintings. And any language he had was probably very basic. They're on the path toward humanity. These human-like creatures they were very similar to us in lots of ways, but they weren't fully modern. They weren't what I would call human. But then something happened, something astonishing. Somewhere around 60,000 years ago, Homo sapiens changed. They acquired the ability to talk, create, and control the world around them. We see a sea change in the way people made their tools, and we see the beginnings of art, the blossoming of true human creativity, possibly modern language. It was a great leap, as anthropologists call it. It was a change from being fairly primitive culturally to being fully modern, to being the way we are today. But what was it that caused Homo sapiens to make this huge transition? What could have happened to accelerate human progress to such an extent that in less than 75,000 years, we went from being little more than primitive cavemen to the most powerful species to ever stride the planet? One possibility is that something catastrophic happened that forced the most able, intelligent, and imaginative of our species to adapt and survive. But what? To find out, Naked Science travels 74,000 years back in time to look at a cataclysmic disaster. Are modern humans the result of a volcano that nearly destroyed us? 74,000 years ago, one of the largest supervolcanoes ever erupts in Indonesia. The fallout has devastating consequences. Over the next thousand years, the world's climate changes beyond all recognition. The global temperature drops dramatically. Europe and parts of China become uninhabitable. Shortly after this, the world enters an ice age. Africa wasn't actually getting that much colder, but it was getting a lot drier. Um, there's good evidence that large parts of the savannas that people were adapted to live on at that time were drying up and disappearing, turning to deserts. And the food resources were getting scarce, or water was getting scarcer. Scientists like Wells believe that at this time, the Earth's population of Homo sapiens fell to dangerously low levels, to numbers well below many endangered species today. The best estimate is that the population dropped as low as a few thousand individuals, possibly one or two thousand individuals. For scientists, it's a population bottleneck, a narrowing of the variety of the human race. The climate change could have meant the end of humanity, but in fact, it may have been the making of us. The survivors went through a, a sea change in human behavior. They went through a change in the way they made tools. Art makes its appearance. Probably syntactic, modern language makes its appearance around that time. And so the evidence is that, that we became fully modern at that time. And the survivors were the ones who were smart enough to make it through that, that rough period. The first signs of human creativity stem from after the supervolcano eruption. The earliest human art forms are 40,000 years old. Not only do they show that our ancestors were thinking creatively, they also show that humans were communicating these thoughts. And for that, some experts believe, they must have had language. Other discoveries show evidence of human burial, hinting at spirituality and symbolism. For scientists like Wells, 
the survivors of the bottleneck are the first to display truly human qualities. I would say that that is, yes, when we became human. That's when we became fully modern humans. At some point, approximately 50 to 60,000 years ago, modern humans arrive. It's an astonishing transformation. Other creatures walked on two legs, made tools, and controlled fire. But in a crucial breakthrough, our ancestors go so much further. By thinking ahead, planning, communicating, Homo sapiens lift themselves above all other species on Earth and become modern humans. But when exactly did this happen and where? In a quest to answer these questions, Spencer Wells has turned to the genetic evidence that lies within all of us. Effectively, everybody is carrying around a history book in their blood, in every cell in their body. In his bid to unravel our past, Wells travels the world in search of some of the most isolated communities. He takes blood samples and studies the DNA they contain. What he is looking for are tiny variations in the genetic code called mutations. These can occur when copying mistakes are made, as DNA is passed from one generation to the next. Over many generations, these mutations build up. They act like a kind of molecular clock, enabling geneticists to estimate how old a species is. By analyzing the DNA he has collected, Wells and his colleagues make an astonishing discovery. Everyone on Earth, it turns out, has a common origin. We are all descended from one man, a survivor of the bottleneck. And he lived around 60,000 years ago. Even more astonishingly, genetics gives us a clue as to how our ancestors may have looked. From the DNA gathered around the world, scientists believe they have tracked down the oldest tribe on the planet. This research brings Wells to Africa, the cradle of humanity. He's here to meet the sand people of the Kalahari Desert. The DNA of the sand suggests that they are the most direct descendants of the few thousand Homo sapiens thought to have survived the population bottleneck. In a way, you carry a secret in your blood, and you can think about it like a family tree. Yeah. So it's a great privilege for me to come and meet my distant relatives. The Sands' status as oldest tribe appears to be confirmed by what Wells sees in their faces. Hidden in their features lie the traces of the many peoples of the world. The high cheekbones of Mongolians, the eye shape of East Asians, the mid-brown skin that can turn lighter or darker. More significantly, their faces are vestiges of those who survived the population bottleneck, the very first truly modern humans. From their gene base burst forth the incredible explosion of human creativity that would change the world forever. Those 2,000 people who made it through this, this bottleneck event, as we call it, this near extinction, are our ancestors. They're the first modern humans. And it's their offspring who went on to populate the world. The six billion people on Earth today are all descendants of these first modern humans. The development of our human qualities has taken well over four million years to evolve. Over that time, our predecessors learned how to walk on two legs, make tools, compete with predators, control their surroundings, and eventually survive a calamitous natural disaster. Despite nearly meaning our extinction, a supervolcano may have helped spur the making of us. It triggered an acceleration of creativity. That is just the most recent sprint in the long relay race of human evolution, and set us apart from the rest of the animal kingdom.